After we generate the regression coefficients, how do we test for the significance of the regression coefficients? In order to illustrate the significance test of the regression coefficients, I return to the same example that I've used in the previous two or three videos where I've imagined a small sample, a very small sample of only 10 paired observations where X is my independent variable and represents years of education. So here I have a nine is nine years of education or let's say a freshman in high school. And then Y is my dependent variable and is the hourly wage. So 12 is $12 per hour. So I only have 10 paired observations. They are plotted with the blue circles. And then I asked Excel to generate for me the regression line where I'm regressing the hourly wage, the dependent variable. I'm regressing that on the independent variable, the years of education. And Excel returns for me a slope and an intercept that is generated by an approach to this best fit line that is called OLS, standing for Ordinary Least Squares. Not the only approach to generating the best fit line, but the most common and popular. So I get a slope of 1.35, which we can interpret as for each one year increase in the independent variable, a one year increase in years of education is associated with a plus $1.35 increase in the hourly wage on average. So I have these regression coefficients. And then what I also show here is Excel's line est array function, which returns for me, in this case, 10 statistics or values that are associated with this regression. I get two columns here because this, I have two coefficients, a, a, a slope and an intercept. So in a univariate regression, I'm gonna get two columns because I only have one independent variable. Now, a typical next step after we've generated the regression is to ask the question, are these coefficients significant? In particular, we would ask this of the slope coefficient here, 1.35. So the line est function gives us naturally the values in order to do that. And you can see the first row in the line est function are the regression coefficients themselves. Here I have the slope and here I have the intercept. The second row is the standard errors of the same coefficients that are in the first row, right? So again, if I had two independent variables, I would get another column. If I had three independent variables, then I would have four columns. So here I only have the one independent variable. So here in the second column is the $1.35 at the slope, and then I have its standard error. So what is the standard error? Well, the standard error is really just a standard deviation. It's just that the $1.35 here, the slope coefficient is a regression coefficient, but technically it's an estimate that's produced by the estimator, and the estimator is the recipe or formula that produces for us this estimate. Every time we go and sample, in theory, we would get a different sample out of the population and each sample would generate for us a different sample regression function, the SRF. I covered that in the first video. So that this regression coefficient itself is a random variable. So the standard deviation of the estimate is called a standard error but it's just a standard deviation. So we're getting here a measure of the variability or dispersion of this estimate. So it's natural that it's in the second row. Now the line S function doesn't do the next step, which is a division. Um, some software does do that, but the line S function doesn't do it because we really don't need it to do it. We can do it ourselves. And that is to say we can compute the T value or test statistic, if you like, here simply by dividing, in this case, the $1.35, that's the slope coefficient, divided by its standard error. So you can see here we get 3.257. And so what we've done is we've actually just standardized this value.
And if we want to be explicit about what we're doing with this division, then you may recall when we just do a simple test of a sample mean on a large sample, we say that z value is equal to the sample mean divided by the null hypothesized mean, and we div divide that by the uh, standard deviation or of the population, or more likely, the sample standard deviation. Well, what we're doing here is directly analogous to that, except that it's a student's t distribution with a certain degrees of freedom, actually shown right here in the line s function. So it's going to be eight in this case. And a student's t distribution then characterizes the distribution of this variable. And in this case, you can see by way of analogy, our test statistic, instead of a sample mean, is the observed slope. The, so that's the regression coefficient. And I'll just use B1, pretty typical there, for the slope coefficient. And we're subtracting the null hypothesis. And pretty typical to denote that with a Greek beta. And then we divide by analogous to the standard deviation, in this case, just the standard error of the B1 coefficient. In the typical test of significance, the null hypothesis is implicitly zero. And so you can see how this being a zero is y, the beta being a zero of the null hypothesis is y. The typical test value is just the slope coefficient divided by its standard error. And then, as you can see, naturally in the line S function, it's just that first row divided by the second row. To reflect the idea that implicitly our null hypothesis is that the true slope is zero. Well, why is that? Well, that's because if you think about a, if the slope were zero, we would have a horizontal line which would effectively be saying that a change in years of education has no impact on the hourly wage. So a null hypothesis that says the slope coefficient is zero gives rise to an alternative hypothesis that the slope is non-zero and therefore there is a relationship between these variables. So what we get here is 3.25 for the test statistic, and that's really a standard standard deviation. This It's saying that this observed 1.35 is 3.2 standard deviations away from our hypothesized null value of zero, which is actually pretty far in a student's t distribution. After all, a student's t distribution, as the sample size increases, converges on the normal. So we're pretty far out in the tail. And in fact, we can compute the p-value by just using the t distribution function. I'm going to assume a two-tailed distribution. And it returns for us, you can see here, a two-tailed p-value associated with this 3.25 of basically 1.2%. And so what that's saying, if we imagine the t distribution, so it's almost normal, but it's fatter and what we're saying is we've observed a 3.257 or a 3 positive 3.257. And the 1.2% is telling us that given that value and the shape of that student's T, we're getting 0.6% in each tail. So they add up to 1.2%. And so in a two-tailed test, the 1.2% is the sum of our rejection region. That's our exact significance level. And we could put that another way, the way that I like to put that, with a 1.2% p-value or exact significance level that corresponds to saying that we could reject this null with a confidence level of 98.8% or 1 minus 1.2%. Again, we can reject the null hypothesis being that the true coefficient here is zero. We can reject that with a confidence in this case of 98.8%. So with a high degree of confidence, we're gonna say, we're gonna reject the null that there's no relationship in favor of there being a relationship here.
what about the degrees of freedom that I input there? Right, because I did need to provide the degrees of freedom. This t value is almost normal, but it's really fatter the smaller the sample size. And I, you can see I drew directly from the 8 that's in the table here. So the line s function gives us the degrees of freedom of 8. I know this can be challenging to new learners especially, but the what we really had here with t degrees of freedom is t n minus k. And in this case, it's 10 minus 2. The sample size is 10, and we're subtracting 2. Why are we subtracting 2 to get the degrees of freedom? Simply because we're estimating two coefficients, right? A slope and an intercept. So we always include the intercept. So the 8 here, another way, here's another tip. The 8 here is also the sample size of 10 minus the number of columns because we're going to have one column here for each coefficient that's estimated. So the 8, that's degrees of freedom that informs the student's t, is 10 minus two coefficients, including the intercept, that we needed to estimate. And so um, that's our uh, p-value associated with this t-value or test statistic that was generated by simply dividing the coefficient by its standard error. And you can see the much more, that's going to be much more relevant in this case for the slope than for the intercept. But um, just by the way, when we do that for the intercept, this 3.84 has such a high dispersion that the t value is only 0.67. So only 0.67 standard, standard deviations away from zero, not very many. The p value is fully 52% we would fail to reject the null that the true value there is zero. So I hope that's a helpful explanation of the uh, test of significance of the regression coefficients in the OLS approach to the regression line.